Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so happy uh, to that you've come to Keeping It Clean Upstream, uh, presented by Jessica Gillian. Um, this presentation is co-hosted by Naturescaping of Southwest Washington and the Camas Public Library. Uh, my name is Elliot Stapleton. I'm with the Camas Public Library. Um, I'm just going to give a couple housekeeping items uh, before I turn things over to Marlene from Naturescaping of Southwest Washington. Uh, I just want to let you know that um, it is possible to ask Jessica questions and can encourage you to ask at any point during the presentation. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a little chat icon. And if you click on that, you can type your question into the chat. Um, or if you would like to ask your question out loud, <clears throat> excuse me, feel free to hit the raise hand icon and I can um, uh, grant you permission to ask, ask your question out loud. So uh, you've got a couple of options there um, for asking questions. And again, you can do that at any point uh, in the presentation. Uh, I also want to let people know that this um, presentation will be recorded. Um, and once it's posted to the Camus Public Library's YouTube page, uh, I will send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered and with that link. So you can watch it again or, or share it with your friends. Um, I think that is it for me. So I'm gonna turn things over to Marlene from Naturescaping of Southwest Washington. Marlene. Hey, hi everybody. Um, I don't know how many actual Naturescaping members there are listening right now, but um, for all you members, this is your monthly perk of a class for your membership and for others, feel free to become a member. And once we get in person, um, you'll be awarded the ability to come to our in-person classes. Um, next month, we are having our Art in the Garden event. It's July 10th at the Gardens at 140, um, on 149th Street. Please check out our website, www.naturescaping.org find out more information about that. That's basically a day, it's a Sunday when we invite artists and we have more artists than this year than ever to come set up in the various paths in the gardens. We'll have musicians, they'll be selling art. You can come and talk to other fellow gardeners or just people who appreciate the garden. So feel free to come, that's free to the public. And again, if you're interested in membership or finding out more about what we do, with Naturescaping, um, please check out our website. And basically, we are the group uh, that maintains the Wildlife Botanical Gardens. If you haven't been there, please check it out. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jessica. She will tell you all about herself and her group. And um, I hope you enjoy this. this. is a little bit of a different topic for us, but I think it's very important. And I hope you all will agree. Take it away, Jessica. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you all. I want this to be a little more interactive than just a presentation. So like, um, like they were saying, feel free to ask questions at any point. I'll let you know a little bit about what Surfrider Foundation does. Um, but first I'll tell you a little bit about me. I started volunteering with Surfrider Foundation in 2018 in the Portland area. I grew up in Cannon Beach, Oregon, so the ocean is very near and dear to my heart. And once I found an organization in Portland that was working to protect the ocean, I had to get involved. So I, I started going to all the fun events that we'll tell you about, and then eventually got more involved to being the ocean-friendly restaurant coordinator, which is what I do now. So it's fully volunteer based. All of us have other full time jobs. For example, I am a real estate agent, um, but I get to talk to restaurants in the Portland area and Vancouver area as well and help them become more ocean friendly. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means here soon. All right. So in Portland, you know, we don't have the ocean right here. So we like to say we keep it clean upstream. And that's because we've got our beautiful rivers here between Vancouver and Portland, of course. And everything that flows to the rivers eventually flows to the oceans. And this is just our mission statement in general. We're 
dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean, waves, and beaches through a powerful grassroots activist network. And how Surfrider got started was in California, there is a beach called Surfrider. And the beachfront property owners were really wanting to make that private to those property owners. And other locals got together and they protested that and they said, no, the beaches should be for everyone. And I'm sure a lot of you recreate on the Oregon coast too. We're so lucky that it's 100% public. However, it's one of those things where as a, an Oregon organization too, we're constantly trying to keep that access 100% public. And there's actually some uh, land use issue going on in Coos Bay right now that the Surfrider Coos Bay chapter is helping with because some private citizens have blocked off Lighthouse Beach. They've put up barbed wire and that's how the organization got started, you know, letting everyone have access to the beaches and we're still, still fighting that today. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit, just like Naturescaping. Um, we're, you know, full of environmental advocates, just like you all, and we are a grassroots organization. Just to give you an idea of how the organization is structured, we have a board of directors, then we have a headquarters staff that's headquartered in California, then there's regional staff, so we have two Oregon regional staff, and there are two Washington regional staff up here. And then there are the volunteer run chapters. So you can see the, the closest one to you all is Portland. Um, there's the other Oregon chapters there as well. And then we also have a bunch of Washington chapters. There's um, a couple in the Seattle area, Tacoma and Olympia. All in all, there are 81 chapters and growing. I think we might actually be closer to 85 now. Um, and then there are some youth clubs as well. So if any of you all are teachers, I'd love to chat about youth clubs. Um, there's opportunity for involvement there in the high schools. And then um, we were established in 1984, back when they were trying to keep the access to Surfrider Beach public. So in Portland, we started in 2000 as our own chapter. However, there were activists in Oregon uh, starting in 1993 as uh, an official Oregon chapter. This picture right here is fun. It's some students. It's a bunch of plastic bags, like plastic grocery bags. And they got together to make art out of these plastic bags um, for one of the I, I actually don't remember which one I wasn't around in 2010, but for one of the many um, statements that we've made to our political leaders in trying to decrease plastic and pollution and that sort of thing. So um, aside from protecting our rivers in Portland and really trying to raise awareness, we also have an adopted beach and that's Oswald West Short Sands. So we'll go out there twice a year and do a big project and help the state park and um, it's, it's really fun to get everyone involved on that big day and go out to the coast together. Here, I won't read all of these, but there's some local policy wins listed. Um, one of the, the things that you may remember from 2018 was the city of Portland ended up banning straws, single use straws um, and Surfrider was a big part of that it was called the Ditch the Straw campaign. Um, in Oregon, we also helped to get rid of the single use grocery bags, single use plastic grocery bags, I should say. Um, unfortunately, the timing with the pandemic made that a tough one. It was right before the pandemic when that kicked off and got started for the state. And then um, of course, you know, some stores weren't allowing your reusable bags during the pandemic and whatnot. So there's still work to be done there to get everyone back on board with bringing their own bag to the store and that sort of thing. Do y'all have any questions so far? Um, 
All right. I don't see anything in the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually can't see the chat. Oh, sorry. I said uh, nothing in the chat so far. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> so as far as our core initiatives, we are trying to protect the coast and part of that, you know, has to do with sea level rise. There's some houses down in Tillamook County. You may have seen the photos where the houses are like sliding into the, like onto the beach because of the seawater erosion. So really trying to educate people on how to build around the beach, which is all sand, of course, and try to prevent catastrophic things like that from happening. Um, beach access, we we talked about that a little bit so far. We want everyone to be able to enjoy the beach so and keeping that public. And then protecting the ocean. And a lot of that has to do with um, marine reserves. In Oregon, there are several marine reserves. I'm not actually sure about Washington, but keeping those protected areas protected and um, helping with education around that, as well as you know, trying to reduce single-use plastic and other sorts of pollution from ever entering the ocean, and um, then cleaning up as well what has already washed up on the beach. And then we also do some activism and more so in California and Texas areas with offshore oil drilling. And um, that's something that those chapters are, are passionate about. More recently, there's been talk in Oregon about offshore wind energy. And uh, we hosted a couple informational sections, sessions, I should say, about the offshore wind energy and how it might impact the wildlife, the, the fishing, you know, because that's a big industry as well as tourism and things like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to keep hearing more and we'll continue to provide educational sessions about offshore wind energy because that's a big opportunity for energy off the coast of Oregon. Apparently we have one of the best windiest spots for these massive offshore wind turbines. And then uh, of course, keeping our waters clean as well. That includes the rivers and um, the beaches. We are huge advocates of recreating in the ocean, whether that's just dipping your toes in the sand or letting your, your dogs run around on the beach or actually surfing and fishing and being you know, in the water. Uh, we all need clean water to enjoy that. And I don't know about you all, but I've had my dogs get sick from Giardia, which it was always after we were playing at the beach. And I think they drink the water out of the little runoffs. And um, yeah, not fun for them to get sick while they're just playing on the beach. Dogs love playing on the beach. So with that, we have different core programs. Um, Hold on to your butt is kind of a funny title, but that is um, promoting proper disposal of cigarette butts. And we fund canisters that uh, can go out in front of local businesses or parks. We have one down at Oswald West State Park, our adopted beach, and a couple other beach entrances around the state. And that one, we don't actually have a program lead for right now. So if you're very passionate about cigarette butts, we'd love to talk to you more to, to get you on board to help with that. Um, Rise Above Plastics, just in general, um, you know, decreasing plastic pollution and single use plastics. And we do this by also talking with our local legislators, which we'll talk about in a little bit too. And Ocean Friendly Gardens, that's another program that the Oregon, sorry, the Portland chapter doesn't have a lead for. Um, that could be a really cool opportunity to get that launched and do it in partnership with Nature Escaping if anyone wants to learn more about that and talk more about that, I'd be happy to chat. And then our Blue Water Task Force, that's a fancy way of saying that we test water on the beaches. So, you know, some of the most popular beaches like Seaside and Cannon Beach, we as a Portland chapter are funding volunteers out there. Um, well, not funding the volunteer hours themselves, but funding the lab 
that the volunteers take the supplies to, the water samples to, which is at Seaside High School. And it's really neat because the Seaside High School students are able to learn about the water quality testing and learn how to use the machines and that sort of thing. So we have through our website, you can look and see what the water quality is looking like if you're wanting to go out and recreate on the beach. The state of Oregon doesn't do water quality testing year round. They only do it in the summer right now for some of the popular spots. We're, we're trying to get them to do it year round um, and the more testing sites, the better. But for now we're filling in the gaps there. And then I already mentioned Ocean Friendly Restaurants as one of our programs. And that's just helping restaurants be more sustainable using um, like if you get ketchup on the side with your fries using a little stainless steel reusable ketchup cup versus a plastic cup and some things like that. So speaking of ocean friendly restaurants, we do have one in Vancouver. It's Gray's Restaurant and Bar inside the Hilton Hotel. And there's a list of some of the other Portland ones. Um, I love Porque No. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been there, but their tacos are fantastic. And we have several other restaurants in Oregon and Washington. There's, I think it was 767 was the latest count that I saw nationwide for ocean-friendly restaurants. And it's a free program for restaurants to join. It's, um, it's considered a membership, not necessarily a certification. And we work with them if they don't quite meet the checklist of criteria, we'll work with them to help them get there. And we also offer some discounts on some more sustainable to go packaging and things like that. All right, any questions about our programs? All right. So this is one of our bigger events that we do annually. Um, it's on MLK Day, MLK Day of Service. We get together at a Portland surf shop usually. This was at Kasube that time. And um, we'll draw out a map and sometimes we partner with Solve. You can see the Solve bags here and just make a big impact in the streets with you know, 100 plus people all cleaning up one area at once, it really makes a big impact. We weren't able to do it last year because of COVID or the year before, but we actually, I guess we did do it the year before because it's in January. Um, we did return to doing it this year and we had about 50 people turn out. So it was very exciting to have a, an in-person event again. Here's some other photos of some of the programs we've talked about. You can see over here, She's holding what we use to test the water samples. And then this is actually me in the orange kayak from several years ago. In July, we do a big cleanup on Ross Island. So we paddle from Selwood Park over to Ross Island and um, clean up there after 4th of July. There seems to be a lot of trash there after 4th of July. And Next Adventure, one of the outdoor stores in Portland donates the kayaks and paddle boards for the day. So it's a really fun one. And I'll, I'll give you the dates on all of that at the end. And then this picture down at the bottom, that's some folks cleaning up at the Short Sands Beach. You'll see on the left, some of our executive volunteers with Ted Wheeler, that was from 2018 when they were doing the Ditch the Straw campaign. So we do work with local representatives and uh, national representatives as well. In that screenshot of Zoom, you can see, I'm right, right up there. <laughs> we met with Senator Merkley in March for Ocean Hill Recreation Day. So it used to be a bunch of surf rider volunteers would fly into Washington, D.C., but in the past couple of years, it's been virtual, which has been fantastic because we were able to do over 150 meetings with representatives nationwide. So, and Senator Merkley, we're super lucky in Oregon 
to have Senator Merkley be a big rise above plastic pollutions um, co-sponsor for decreasing plastic pollutions with that bill. So it's been um, really nice to get on those sessions with our re local representatives. And we had folks doing it for Washington too. And, you know, in Oregon and Washington, it's a lot of saying thank you for being on board and thank you for caring about and protecting the ocean. What can we do to help you? And sometimes we get some good, good ideas from that. So there are a lot of ways that you can participate if you're interested. Um, you can become a supporter, a member, or a volunteer. So when I first started volunteering in 2018, I was just showing up to the events that sounded like fun and, and seemed like they had some impact. Um, this is a joke. <laughs> we get asked a lot, do you have to be a surfer in order to participate in surf rider and the answer is definitely no um i happen to surf but that's because i grew up in cannon beach and a lot of people learn how to surf at a young age there but most of our volunteers do not surf you don't have to surf to have an appreciation for the ocean i'm curious though do any of you surf maybe maybe not maybe in the future <laughs> We've also done some clinics to teach people how to surf. So that's some fun stuff that we do. This is a, a picture from a few years ago. It was our executive team at the time and their dogs. Um, every year in December, we get together and plan over a weekend for all the upcoming events for the next year. So this is just a little bit about what we expect volunteers to do, you know, be ocean friendly, be welcoming and respectful and have fun. It's meant for fun for sure. And there are some cool benefits to volunteering. Um, you're being a part of something bigger and you can gain some professional skills to boost your resume and boost your network, of course, and then there's also opportunities for travel. So not only do we have the annual Ocean Hill Recreation Day, which might go back to in-person next year, we also do some regional conferences. And um, every three years, there's a national conference in LA. Of course, there's always community with volunteering. You can make some new friends and maybe learn how to surf, as we like to say. I'm just gonna grab some water. All right, so like I was saying, there's different ways to volunteer, of course. Um, you can just show up to our fun events, bring a friend, they're open to anyone, or you can get on a committee. So if you're really excited about ocean-friendly restaurants and you want to help recruit more restaurants, you can join that committee. Or for example, if you wanted to join um, the executive committee, which is just a fancy way of saying all of our, our major coordinators, then you could do the Ocean Friendly Gardens program or the Hold On To Your Butts program. And we will soon be looking for a secretary who is moving away as well. So because of your involvement and I'm assuming love for gardening and planting, I went ahead and put this in here for tonight. So our Ocean Friendly Gardens program, like I said, it's not something that we have in Portland yet, um, but what they're focusing on is decreasing the urban runoff and pollution that we get from agriculture and um, the education that surrounds that too, you know, promoting people not to use weed killers at home and talking to them about the more environmentally friendly ways of keeping weeds at bay and things like that. So the program educates and assists people in creating landscapes that utilize native plants, permeable ground covers, and water retention features to prevent urban runoff 
create wildlife habitats and design beautiful spaces. Vegetable gardens can be ocean friendly gardens too. From workshops to building gardens, it's a great way to engage. So please let me know if you're interested in getting that program off the ground, that'd be awesome. So some of the recent events that we did, um, it's been an interesting year trying to get back to doing some in-person things while also still offering some online offerings. We did go out to Oswald West in, in April for our big action day. Um, this year, State Parks had us helping with the pathway down to the beach to make it more accessible for people. And they had all sorts of tools and the people working on that task were wearing hard hats and having a lot of fun um, making the pathway wider and more accessible. And then we had other folks cleaning up on the beach, other folks cleaning up the trails within the park. And in years past, we've had some bird surveys going on. Every now and then you'll see a, a dead bird on the beach and there's uh, researchers that are looking for data for what's going on with the birds. Why are we seeing dead birds? And um, just one of, one of the little things that you can do as a citizen scientist. And then also in April, we had a cleanup on April 10th in Portland with the store Free People. And um, we went to OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry put on a really cool event called Party for the Planet and had a lot of environmental organizations there. So we had a table there and met some people. Whoops. Um, and I, I should mention, we try and do a, we call them a green streets cleanup every month. So we had that one with three people in April and in May, we did one with Scott Edwards, which is an architectural firm. In May, we also did a short shorty film festival at Evo, one of the outdoor stores and just showed some cool uh, short locally made videos of enjoying the beach and the ocean. In June, we just had the Otter Rock and Roll. That's a huge event that our Newport chapter puts on and it's a youth surf competition. Um, unfortunately, it was kind of a rainy weekend for that, but it looked like they still had a lot of fun. I saw some pictures and videos and we just did a green streets on at the same day. So a, a cleanup in the local neighborhood around Realm Refillery, which is a new store in Portland. Um, they do a lot of, well, it's all package free. So you can take your, your mason jar or your big glass water bottle, whatever you want to in there and refill it with things like shampoo, but then also uh, all sorts of plant-based foods. They even have package free tofu and hummus and things like that. Really cool store that just opened up in North Portland. And then in July, like I was saying, we have the Selwood Action Day coming up. We always do it after 4th of July. So that's the one where we paddle from Selwood over to Ross Island. It's about a 15 minute paddle. We clean up over there and then we paddle the trash back and uh, usually have some pizza afterwards to celebrate. And we still welcome folks who don't want to paddle for that cleanup. We also have the opportunity to clean up the shoreline at Selwood too. And then in the fall, just looking ahead, um, we will have, we typically have our monthly green streets cleanups as well. We just don't have them all scheduled right now. And we also typically have a, um, a chapter meeting similar to this, where we'll just share some updates and then have a speaker or sometimes a, a film. And uh, we like to offer our members educational opportunities to hear from scientists, professors, other volunteers from other areas. We've had all sorts of cool programs for our monthly chapter meetings. And then the bigger items in the fall, you'll see the Oswald West Action Day. We do that every April and October. We're really looking forward to October and uh, 
we plan, we used to barbecue, but then, you know, COVID mixed things up. So we're planning to do a barbecue again, where we're able to volunteer for a couple hours and then really celebrate and meet one another and make some friends while we're at it. And then every year or every three years, we have a regional conference. Um, so we call the Oregon, Washington and Vancouver, British Columbia area, the Cascadia region. So we'll be doing that conference in the fall. And that's for anyone who's on the executive committee as a volunteer, but it's also for any core volunteers as we call them, people who are really involved, but don't quite have um, the, the time or the commitment to offer for an executive position. So that'll be really fun to get get together with all of the chapters. We haven't seen people from the other chapters in a really long time. If you'd like to join our monthly newsletter, we do send out once a month, just a recap of what we just did, ways to get involved in upcoming events. Um, you're welcome to email me and I think they'll be able to include my email when they send out the link to the YouTube video. And I, I can get you added to that email list. You're also welcome to go to our portlandsurfrider.org website. And um, there's a button on there to sign up for the newsletter as well. The best way to stay the most engaged and the most up to date is our Instagram. Our volunteer that runs the Instagram does a really good job of sharing things that are happening with other like-minded organizations and also sharing the most up-to-date of what Surfrider Portland has planned. Um, we also try and keep our Facebook really updated and for any of those larger events where we have to kind of keep an eye on how many participants we will have and maybe have a cap for participants due to supplies for like a neighborhood cleanup or something like that. We post those on Eventbrite. So if you're interested in joining, it's always helpful to go ahead and sign up for to follow, I think is what they call it on Eventbrite. Um, and it's just all under Surfrider Portland. And that way you'll, however you have your notification set up, you'll either get an email um, letting you know that there's a new Eventbrite event added for Surfrider Portland. And then we also have a blog on our Surfrider Portland website, but our two Oregon staff members do a fantastic job of keeping the broader Oregon Surfrider site um, pretty active with blogs. Um, in fact, if folks have interest, we can click this link and we can look at the 2021 year in review. So you can kind of see what we did as a larger state in 2021 with all the chapters working together. That's what I've got. Any questions? Yeah, just a reminder too, <clears throat> if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat. <clears throat> oh, um, actually, or raise your hand uh, like um, Marlene has right now. Yes, it's me. So I have several questions actually love it so anyway yeah i would like to see your 21 your year in review after we're done too but sure. in the meantime okay so i guess one of my questions is um i'd like to hear a little bit more about the gardening aspect uh, as far as do you guys talk about rain gardens um lasagna gardening i mean do you have someone who would teach all these concepts um yeah. more about the gardening thing, what practices in particular. Um, natives, I think everybody kind of knows what that is, but um, you know, what kind of what kind of education do you offer in that regard? So that's one. Um, another okay. one is I'd like to find out more about how the restaurant thing works. So for example, and I know you're directly involved in that, so you'd be good to do you just go to restaurants and say, hey, do you want to be involved with this program or do you wait till they contact you? I mean, how do you let them know there, there is such a thing even? Um, do you actively go out and try to educate restaurants? Do you go to certain ones, like maybe ones that offer healthier 
food or something. I mean, that's, I think that's really interesting. And thirdly, um, I wonder, do you guys have any kind of recycling? Do you deal with recycling at all? I, I don't know about, I know Portland's really good about it, but up here, it seems they recycle less and less instead of more and more, which is very frustrating. I'm also a master composter recycler. So I'm really interested in, in that if that's something you do or perhaps would consider doing, um, trying to find more, so some people who want to accept, I know the problem here is finding people who want to buy the recycled material. That's what restricts what they will recycle or not. They yeah. can't find a market for it, so they don't recycle it. Um, I wondered if how involved, if any, you guys would get into that. All right, great questions. Um, I will answer the recycling question first. So we don't have a specific program for promoting proper recycling. Um, with the Ocean Friendly Restaurants Program, we actually reorganized it in 2021 and they actually moved recycling down the list of requirements because we've learned that other things are like, you should be doing other things before you recycle, right? Recycling is the last resort. You should reuse and reduce what you're using to start with and that sort of thing. So Surfrider as a broader organization has tried to kind of take the focus off of recycling in general and um, has pointed the focus more towards reducing the single use items before we ever have to deal with disposing of them. Um, as far as the ocean friendly gardens, I don't know a whole lot about the program because we haven't had it in, and it's a newer program for surf rider nationally. We haven't had a program lead for ocean friendly gardens in Portland. Um, I do know for our other programs like ocean friendly restaurants, they have a tremendous amount of resources for us and whoever would want to get involved with that. There's always training opportunities. There's a big online resource with, um, you know, different kind of marketing materials as well as educational materials. But um, yeah, it's something I'm definitely curious to know more about as well. I'm not sure of any of the techniques that they advise on, um, just that in general, they're looking for more permaculture and you know, drought resistant things and just, you know, sustainable practices in general, less chemicals and things like that. I would love to know a little more about that. And then as far as ocean friendly restaurants go, um, I'm really glad you asked that. So one of the ways that we can kind of spread the word for ocean friendly restaurants together is yeah, going to your favorite restaurant, especially like you were saying, if they have a healthier option, healthier options on the menu and they already seem to be, um, you know, purchasing to go products that are more sustainable and that sort of thing. It's a, a really easy conversation to just say, Hey, have you ever heard of ocean friendly restaurants? It's a program that Surfrider foundation has. There's some local restaurants involved with it. And it's, it's just a membership and it's another marketing tool for those restaurants to be able to use our broader national network of 750 plus um, ocean friendly restaurants. And as that program grows, it's going to be more and more powerful for the marketing side of things for restaurants. On our website, there is a map with, that is updated live when we get new restaurants added. So if you're going to Chicago, which we do actually have a Chicago Surfrider chapter with the Great Lakes there, um, you can look up and see, oh, what, what restaurants should I support in Chicago that are doing ocean-friendly things? So um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool program. And the, one of the other good benefits is that they can get the discounts, like I was saying, on some of the to-go items that are more sustainable. We try and steer restaurants away from using any sort of bioplastics. So the way we think of it is that if it looks like plastic, it's going to act like plastic um, as it's decomposing. Here in Portland, we don't have a 
commercial grade, high heat, high pressure, whatever they call it, um, composting system to break down those cups that say they're compostable that, and they can't be broken down in our normal at home compost either. So we try and steer clear of those. And of course, a lot of restaurants think they're doing the right thing and purchasing those because they seem to be more earth friendly options, but, um, we can help them find some better options. They also save money by using reusables, um, which is really cool. Revolution Hall, you may have gone to a program or a concept concert there. They have those stainless steel cups that they use for their beer pints instead of using plastic cups for their beer. They don't want glass in the auditorium breaking and whatnot. So they came up with the great solution of using the reusable stainless steel pint glasses instead. Did that answer your questions? Yeah, go ahead, Marlene. Yeah. yeah, so yes, it did to a large degree. I I would be interested in a little bit more specifics about, I, I totally understand and I agree that recycling isn't the end all. It, it is re, um, reducing and reusing, as you say, but yeah. so you said it was moved down to lower on the scale. What, what are some of the other specific criteria that you, uh, I would like to hear, what are the criteria? Sure, so the ocean friendly restaurant criteria are, um, well, one of them is recycling and composting, depending on what's available to your municipality and um, no plastic bags for your takeout no plastic ware, so no plastic forks, or like we were talking about the plastic ketchup cups for dine in. So we want everything for dining in to be reusable and having a vegan and vegetarian option on the menu is Yay. one of, yes, <laughs> um, that's one of the criteria, um, no styrofoam. And then there's a couple other criteria that are optional. Um, and those include using like high efficiency light bulbs and things like that, kind of next level items. Um, but by and large, it's about reducing the waste that the restaurants are producing. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, there are sometimes there are other containers that they're using to go, but and they seem like maybe they're cardboardish and that they would be better. But again, yeah. you, it's kind of, you don't know, you think you're doing better. Um, I don't know if you could bring this up at all or how you feel about this, but I actually would like to see restaurants sort of like if you ever go to Starbucks and I'm not definitely not promoting them, but <laughs> they let you bring your own cup. So <laughs> you could use that. And I was wondering if it's ever brought up about, especially for carry out, of course, if you could bring your own container. So I use glass. Yeah. And if I'm going to a restaurant and I know that I'm going to be taking stuff home, I'm not going to eat it all. And so I'm going to bring the rest home. I bring my own container and um, just kind of put my food in that to take home. And they, of course, never say anything. But <laughs> I mean, I just wonder if you could just skip that you know, just directly go to, hey, I'm going to carry out. Can you just put it in my container? I mean, I, I yeah. guess it would kind of be hard to do because they try to get your carry out food together for you by the time you get there. So I guess that wouldn't really work. <laughs> I, I love that you brought that up. We, in the state of Oregon, I'm not sure what the Washington regulations are, but there's a really funny regulation in the state of Oregon that says you cannot do that. Um, you know, someone thought it was a good idea for food safety and health and whatnot to not allow you to bring your own container into a restaurant. However, you know, like you said, people don't really say anything about it when you do it. Um, and same goes for in the produce section in Oregon, you're technically not allowed to bring your own reusable produce bag to get your cilantro or your parsley or whatever. Wow. So that is something that Surf Rider Foundation, Oregon chapter specifically, has tried to get changed in the last Oregon legislative session. 
we had it on the table, um, I think, to tack on to a, another bill, and it didn't get anywhere, unfortunately. So we have to wait for the next legislative session, but there are some folks behind the scenes um, and other organizations who have also got on board with trying to change that silly health code so that it is okay <laughs> and allowed by everyone to bring your own produce bag to the produce section or your own takeout container in a restaurant. Um, and also in Portland, we have Go Box. I know they've done some piloting in the Seattle area. I am not sure if they're doing anything in Vancouver right now, but it is a, a business that has reusable takeout containers and you use an app on your phone to check out a container. I pay, I think it's $28 for the year to have two containers available at any given time. So right now I have two containers that I recently used in my car that I need to take back and they clean them and sanitize them um, in between uses. And we're fortunate that New Seasons Grocery Store has started allowing go box to be used and also the bulk section they were usable in the like the deli counter if you wanted to go get uh lasagna or something from the deli counter in the go box you could but you can also use them for your bulk rice or bulk hazelnuts now as well so um there's a lot of people working on progress for reusable items and a fun event we did last year actually was a reusable coffee cup crawl. So like a bar crawl, but for coffee shops in the Portland area. And some folks got together. I wasn't able to go, but they got on their bikes. They had their reusable coffee cup and they biked around in support of these Portland coffee shops that are allowing reusable coffee cups in their shops. So oh, that was, cool. that was pretty cool. I should also mention real quick about ocean friendly restaurants. If a restaurant comes to mind, feel free to contact me by email. My email is there. Um, and if it, there's some a restaurant that you have in mind that you think would be a good candidate, but you're not the type of person to raise your hand in a restaurant and say, hey, have you heard of this? I would be happy to reach out to them. Um, or if you do make mention of it, while you're at the restaurant, if you're able to get the manager's contact information, that's always very helpful. And you can pass that along to me and then I can follow up with all the program details. If we were in person, I would offer you a, um, we have a membership booklet or a, an ocean friendly restaurant membership recruiting booklet. Um, so if you want to get more involved with that, that's something that we can definitely provide to you. So you're able to walk in with a nice booklet into the restaurant and kind of go over the program with them. And uh, the sign up takes them like 10 minutes online and it's free for them to join. However, there's also an option for them to add a donation to help support the, the larger surf rider programs. Do you ever work with chains? Because that would be a big bang for the buck. Yeah, definitely. So Surfrider Headquarters does work with chains and that's how we got into the Gray's restaurant in Vancouver inside the Hilton. So they they came up with a partnership with Hilton for their restaurants. Um, I know they've worked with some other chains and they even worked with, I cannot remember if it's, I think it's DoorDash. Uh, I get DoorDash and Grubhub confused, but I think it's DoorDash that they worked with, where if you're ordering food to be delivered through DoorDash, there's actually a filter now that you can add for ocean-friendly restaurants. And I know they're in talks with Yelp as well to get that to be able to be a search feature on there. Cool. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, if you if you wanted to raise your hand and ask your question out loud too, you can do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and just want to send a reminder to or say a reminder too that this is recorded and we'll send it out as well sounds good well since we have a couple minutes should we go ahead and kind of breeze through the 2021 review yeah sounds good. all right let's hope this link works <laughs> Can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Awesome. So this will be super easy to find later if you wanted to by just searching Oregon Surf Rider. Um, and then under the blog section, they put together this review of what we did in 2021, which of course was a challenging year um, with COVID. So there were two new intertidal marine protected areas welcomed for designation. <clears throat> Uh, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. We have someone from Surfrider that sits on that statewide council and they um, were trying to get more areas added as marine protected. So they got the marine garden at Coquillil. I don't think I'm saying that right, Point, and research reserve at Cape Blanco to join as the intertidal rock stars, as Charlie put it. Um, there was some progress made with, in 2020, Facebook had underwater sea cables in the Pacific City area that they were trying to land on the beach and set up a terminal that was in a neighborhood for these underwater sea cables to land. So Surfrider helped author and pass new legislation supporting stronger planning and protection for the Oregon seafloor in the future so that if you know we can prevent incidents from this happening in the future. <clears throat> We've done a lot of policy work. So with our two staff members, we have Bree, who is our chapter support staff. And then we have Charlie, who is really, he's the policy manager. He's very involved. He's on the Ocean Policy Advisory Committee and um, he's very, knowledgeable and involved with policy and knows a lot of our local legislators. Um, we were able to meet with 163 Senate and House offices last year during Hill Day. This year it was even more. I think it was closer to 180 and that was nationwide. Um, we did make some progress, although there's still work to be done with the legislative stuff at a national level and at a local level. Uh, Newport passed the most comprehensive plastic food container and foodware ordinance in the state, which is really cool because we're able to, you know, once one city, one municipality does it, the rest can kind of follow by example. <clears throat> this of course, is a picture of all the microplastics that washed up on the beach during a, a storm. Um, these photos are from the zoo, the Oregon Zoo, with Senator Merkley. And here's Charlie, the policy manager that I was talking about. We had a break up with plastic event at the zoo where Senator Merkley spoke and they, they made a press conference out of it. Here's various photos from <clears throat> uh, different cleanups around the state. We found a tire. <laughs> that was at the Selwood Action Cleanup Day. They're not light <laughs> if you've ever tried to pick up a tire. So there were over 800 cleanups uh, nationwide, and I'm sure there were more that weren't technically documented. And uh, nearly a thousand volunteer leaders engaged in our programs. We opened, uh, we reopened our Blue Water Task Force labs, six of the seven, so that we can continue to um, monitor the water quality. And there's a link on here if you wanted to see a demonstration that the Seaside High School lab put on, um, really cool. And you can learn more about that program too. With Congress passing the 1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure and jobs investment act, it partially funds wastewater upgrades to protect beach water quality from sewage and urban runoff. I know in Cannon Beach specifically, because I grew up there, 
uh, the the infrastructure, the sewer lines are very dated and in some places failing. So um, there's a lot of infrastructure upgrades that are needed in the state of Oregon to help keep the water clean. Oh, here's, here's a photo of <clears throat> the seawall that collapsed in front of these beachfront homes. Um, and you know, now, now people are more aware of how not to build <laughs> and perhaps seawalls sea don't, aren't the right answer. There was a liquid natural gas project um, in Jordan Cove that Surf Rider came out with other local citizens and uh, tried to stop that. And they did stop it. I shouldn't say tried, they did stop it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that went on in 2021. Lighthouse speech access, that's what I mentioned at the beginning that um, there's some private citizens that are trying to keep that beach access to themselves. And it's been an ongoing effort to, and there's a more specific blog on here if you wanted to get more info on the specifics, um, but they've gotten into some legal action. And we're always looking for new members. Our membership, you can still show up to an event and volunteer even if you're not a member, um, but being a member is a minimum donation of $25 or more annually. And uh, we do some membership appreciation events from time to time as well. And it's just a cool way to be a part of something bigger. We'll end with this funny photo. <laughs> of our October Oswald West Action Day last year. I think it was it was either on Halloween or the day or before or day after. So we had folks dress up in costume for that cleanup. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I hope this was informative. I hope you're excited about participating in some of our, our programs together. And maybe we can get a Vancouver chapter started or or just uh, really team up and do some stuff across the river with the Oregon chapter or the Portland chapter. And maybe we'll get an ocean friendly gardens program going too. Thank you so much, Jessica, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, before we uh, head out, uh, Marlene and Jessica, any final words? Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to thank Jessica again. I wasn't really familiar with your group and now I am and I can direct people your way. And yeah, I think it would, would really would be cool to get a garden friendly. We'll see if we can do something about that. And yeah. thank you so much, Elliot, as always. Our partnership is lasting way longer than anyone ever thought with the COVID and, and, and everything. So you've been great. We really appreciate it. As, and thank you very much to both of you again. And thanks for spending your afternoon with us, Jessica. I know you're really busy as a realtor right now, too. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, Come to our, the garden, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.